This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you all for coming to our last mini medical um, school for women's health. I hope that every that all of the lectures have been enjoyable and educational. Again, my name is Jeanette Lager. This is Dr. Kohi. She's from the Department of Radiology, Vascular Interventional Radiology section. And um, how many people here know somebody or are someone who has had fibroids? And how many people know somebody or um, is somebody who's had a hysterectomy or was recommended a hysterectomy? So quite a lot, um, which is representative of the general population. 75% of women by the age of 50 will have fibroids. Not all of those women will need treatment for it, but up to 20% will need treatment for fibroids because they're symptomatic. Let's start with a historical perspective on the treatment of fibroids. In 1937, Dr. Bonnie, a gynecologist, described this case that changed his outlook. A lady, recently married, wishing above all things to have a child, underwent a hysterectomy on account of a single fibroid. Being a woman of strong character, she accepted the blow without complaint, and none but those who knew her well perceived the tragedy. I was among this number, and the grief of it is still keen in me today. He was actually describing what happened to his wife. They had met in 1905, and Annie began to have heavy periods in 1907. When she was diagnosed with fibroids, she went to, to Middlesex Hospital, and all of the senior consultants recommended a hysterectomy. There was another option at that time, which was a myomectomy to remove the fibroid alone. However, it was not as common because of the high blood loss associated with the procedure. Dr. Bonnie made it his life's work to find um, techniques to reduce the blood loss with myomectomies. Today we're going to go over an overview of uterine fibroids, discuss the types and classifications of fibroids, discuss common presentations of fibroids, and then we'll discuss treatment including medications, radiology procedures, and surgical options. There are a couple words that we use in um, scientific literature that are all pretty equivalent, and so I just listed them here. Fibroids are also sometimes called myomas or lyomyomas, but they're all considered the same thing. Removal of the uterus or hysterectomy is second only to cesarean delivery as the most common surgical procedure performed in the US. The fact that this procedure can only be performed on half of the adult population doubles the relative frequency for which it is performed. One study found that of all post-hysterectomy specimens, 77 to 80% had fibroids on pathology. On average, there are about 7.6 fibroids per specimen. And fibroids cause symptoms in nearly a quarter of all women of reproductive age. It's widely believed that there's a much larger population of women who have fibroids, but many of them are unaware of the fibroids because they do not have symptoms. There's a lot of information on the slide to discuss the different risk factors. And I didn't cite all of the studies here, but I'm happy to provide that information if you're interested. Studies show that black women are more prone to de developing fibroids, the prevalence be being two to three times the rate of white women. The cumulative incidence of fibroids by, of any age, as I mentioned, by age 50 was 80% for black women and nearly 70% for white women. Black women develop symptoms earlier, have a higher growth rate of fibroids after 35 years old, have more severe disease based on symptoms, and more extensive disease at the time of hysterectomy. Researchers are not yet able to explain such statistics, but there's continued research on this. With regards to menstrual history, early menarche 
or early periods increases the risks of fibroids. Prenatal exposure to DES increases the risk of fibroids. Parity or number of pregnancies uh, decreases the burden of disease. And we found that 80% of fibroids seem to be smaller after pregnancy. There aren't a lot of studies on dietary lifestyle and habits, but there is a suspected increase associated with obesity, alcohol, high glycemic index, and vitamin D deficiency. There is an increased relative risk of consumption with red meat and ham of 1.3 to 1.7. And there's a decreased relative risk with green vegetables and fruit, especially citrus. We do know that some fibroids have a familial disposition in some but not all women, and that there is increasing evidence of specific susceptibility genes for fibroids. A normal uterus is about the size of a pear or about the size of my fist. So as you can imagine, a fibroid that is the size of, of my fist or just one, one of those fibroids doubles the size of the uterus. Fibroids are generally round, but not always and are well circumscribed nodules. If you look microscopically, you can see the world areas here. And those are the areas of the fibroids surrounded by myometrium. They're uniform and contiguous in nature. When it comes to fibroids, depending on the location, it can cause different types of symptoms. So one needs to be concerned about the location of the fibroid because that gives us more information about what types of symptoms they can cause. When you look at the uterus, it's actually a large muscular organ. So in pregnancy, when the pregnancy is in the middle of the uterus, the uterus enlarges, the myometrium thins, and when women have contractions, the uterus, the muscular area contracts, the cervix dilates, and the baby is delivered. So when we look at the muscular layer, this is where we see intramural fibroids in this area here. If you look at the area that is deeper, this is the endometrium, and fibroids that are located in this area are considered su submucosal fibroids. They can sometimes be pedunculated, so this one shows it being on a stalk, or it, they can even be abutting the endometrium, so right near the endometrium and causing indentation. Here are subserosal fibroids, which are on the outside muscle layer of the uterus. They can also be pedunculated. Um, and then they can also expand through the whole um, my, myometrium or muscle layer. In 2011, one of the OBGYN organizations presented a staging criteria for benign fibroids based on the location of the fibroid. This image shows the area that we were looking at before of the normal uterine muscle. And they are classified into 0 to 3 as being submucosal, 4 being intramural, and then five to eight being subserosal or pedunculated or other, which means that they can sometimes be not attached to the uterus but into the broad ligament or into the areas that are near the uterus. They can also be a hybrid of all of these. This classification helps us to organize a lot of the communication on fibroids, including symptoms, so we'll go over symptoms as well. Here's an image of a normal-sized uterus, and relative to um, other organs in the abdomen, you can see the colon is in the back, the bladder is in the front, here's the vagina that's right up to where the cervix is located. And you can imagine that as the uterus grows and if fibroids grow in certain areas that it can cause symptoms. So a fibroid that is more in the front or more anterior can compress on the bladder. A fibroid that enlarges towards the back can compress onto the colon. Fibroids that grow up can cause increased abdominal girth. And sometimes fibroids that are down in the area that are close to the cervix can cause discomfort or pain with intercourse. So bulk symptoms are bloating, increased abdominal girth, constipation, urinary frequency, dysmenorrhea or pain with periods can be one of the symptoms. Dyspareunia is pain with intercourse. That happens mostly with the ones that are more anterior. Pain can happen when fibroids grow, and sometimes they'll overgrow their blood supply, or they'll torse and twist upon themselves, and that can also cause pain. And then the ones that are in the middle part, the submucosal fibroids, can also be associated with heavy menstrual bleeding. With regards to reproduction and pregnancy, fibroids can sometimes cause pregnancy loss or increased risk of miscarriage, and that can mainly be because of the submucosal fibroids. If the pregnancy implants where the fibroid is located, it can increase the rate of miscarriage. And then with pregnancy in general, it can cause malpresentation, which is generally we expect the babies to go down head first. And so sometimes the babies can't turn into the appropriate position, so that's considered malpresentation.
Placental abnormalities are the way that the placenta attaches to the uterus, so it can be abnormal because of the location of where the fibroid is. It can affect fetal growth because of the placenta attaching to the uterus. And it can also cause an increased rate of postpartum hemorrhage, meaning that the uterus is unable to contract down after delivery, and you can have increased bleeding associated with that. Lots of women do have fibroids and get pregnant and have no problems with their pregnancy as well. So we don't always recommend removal because someone's planning pregnancy. It mainly depends on where the location is. If a patient presents with heavy menstrual bleeding or bulk symptoms after taking a history, it's important, of course, to do a physical exam. And then the next step is imaging. And Dr. Kohi is going to talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Maureen Kohi. I'm an interventional radiologist. And so I see a bunch of patients with fibroids um, as well. So here, um, one of the um, most common uh, imaging studies that is recommended for fibroid uh, diagnosis is an ultrasound. So this here is an image of an ultrasound. How many of you have had ultrasounds before? So some of you, yeah, and it's pretty benign. It's, you know, painless, and they have the warm gel and everything. And um, what you can see is this uh, sort of large structure. That's the uterus. And then you can see it's very nicely these rounded, as, um, as uh, Jeanette was saying, uh, structures that are the fibroids. Um, and you can just imagine that the, without these two things, the uterus would have been much smaller. Um, but now that these two uh, structures or fibroids are present, the uterus is much larger. And as a result, um, there's probably some symptoms that the patient has. There are a couple questions that um, our patients sometimes ask and that I thought were appropriate for us to think about here. And one of them is that some patients ask, do I need to have a transvaginal ultrasound or can I just have an abdominal ultrasound? Yeah, that's a good one. How many have had transvaginal ultrasounds? Right, so um, you know, it's uh, you w it's a little bit more invasive and, and cumbersome, but I think that the reason we like to do transvaginal ultrasound is because the probe is right next to uh, the uterus. It's uh, it's inserted in the vagina, and and so the distance to the uterus is minimized, and as a result, the resolution of pictures is much better. So if you imagine if you're taking a picture of someone that's far away, um, it, it's not as focused as if the person was much closer. Um, additionally, transvaginal ultrasound can show you where the fibroid is in the uterus. And as we talked about, the fibroids can be in multiple different locations. And you may not be able to ascertain that just by doing it transabdominally. So if you really want to know where in the uterus the fibroid is located, um, transvaginal ultrasound is necessary. And lastly, you always want to make sure you see the ovaries and, and anyone who's complaining of pain and pressure and just make sure that the symptom that the patient's presenting with is actually because of uterine fibroids, and then you can definitely see the ovaries much clearer and better with a transvaginal ultrasound. The other thing that um, I always talk to patients about is coming in with a full bladder. And I'm wondering why patients need to come in with a full bladder for their abdominal ultrasounds. I know, I know. That's interesting, right? Because you think your bladder is about to burst, and then they, then the sonographer says, no, you need to drink more water. And the reason is because, um, now this is a transvaginal ultrasound, but if it's a transabdominal ultrasound, what the technology depends on is um, the bladder, the, the liquid in the bladder, um, to allow the, the sound waves that are coming from the probe to just enter the uterus much better. So if you were to think about it, um, think of the bladder and the water in the bladder or the urine in the bladder as a way to enhance your image. And so when you don't have the bladder there, um, it doesn't it doesn't give you as much uh, good images. Additionally, um, in some patients, there's bowel in front of the uterus. Um, it's commonly a location for the bowel. And so and bowel has air in it. And anytime you image through air, um, you can can't really see anything very well. So another reason why we have our patients drink lots and lots of fluid is so that the bladder rises and moves the bowel out of the way, and so you can easily see the uterus and the fibroids. Okay, so um, then uh, here we have another imaging uh, modality, and this is an MRI. How many of you have had MRIs before? 
So yeah, a few. Um, and uh, so here what we see is, now this is see, looking at a patient in profile. So this is the anterior um, front of you, and this is the back, and this is nicely the spine. And the arrow points to this structure. And again, what you can see is the uterus outlined here, and then this very dark structure, which is the fibroid. Here's an example, for example, uh, for a bowel. So this is the colon and the small intestine. And you can see it's draped over here. It doesn't matter with MRI, you don't actually have to have any fluid in your bladder because we can image um, image uh, without having your bladder distended. The beauty of MRI is that there's no radiation um, involved and it can give you uh, very beautiful images of where the fibroid is and give you specific information of the makeup of the fibroid, how vascular it is, how dense it is, just by um, the characteristic and the color of it. Additionally, it can allow you uh, the radiologist and, and the gynecologist to talk about whether it's really the fibroid that's causing these symptoms because if there's just a big mass like an ovarian tumor or something and there is no fibroid or if there's a tiny fibroid and a very big mass then clearly the problem is not the fibroid and some other etiology. Any tips for patients who have claustrophobia? Oh, yes, very question. So um, if you, uh, if for those of you who've had MRIs, um, it is a very tight um, sort of donut hole, and so you're, and it's extremely loud, um, and it's very cold. So none of these three things make anybody feel comfortable, especially people who don't like to be in um, small areas and people who actually have claustrophobia. So uh, the first thing to do is to try to relax, and so they give you the technologists are very familiar with this, and so they offer you either earplugs or offer you um, music to kind of try to relax and not think about the fact that you're in this, you know, very tight space. Um, I think that works uh, in very few patients. One tip that I always tell patients is to see if you can focus on to a point outside. So sometimes we have the patients, instead of lying on their back and sort of staring at the MR uh, tube, kind of flip on their belly and just sort of look out. And as soon as you look outside, side and you see that you see light and other people and maybe the people who are in the back um, trying to work on your images, you feel better. But again, that works for just a fraction of patients. And if you really are concerned about and are anxious, I think the best thing is to take an anti-anxiety medication. And so a little bit of Ativan goes a long way. Um, it kind of relaxes you. You can just, and usually this can take up to 45 minutes and sort of you relax and take a quick nap and, and before before you know it, it's done. And that's something often that you can talk to your gynecologist about in advance because we will often prescribe Ativan or a medicine to just help relax you before. Um, the other question is what about open MRIs? Mm. So open MRI uh, is definitely an option, and, and it is in fact what its what its name stands for. It is open. It's not this tube that you have to kind of squeeze in through. The problem is that the tube is so important because that's how we get these beautiful um, images. With an open MRI, the resolution is not as good, so um, so it, you can sort of get a, a lay of the land of what's going on. But for example, you may not be able to evaluate a patient's ovaries very well. And if you're going through the whole process of getting an MRI to try to determine what your symptoms are, are being caused by, then it's better to get the, mo the, mo the bigger bang for your buck and, and go for a you know, routine MRI if you can with an anxiolytic. Um, and so here is another imaging modality. Now, this is a CT or a CAT scan. Um, and this, this one um, really is not routinely performed for fibroid evaluation. And the reason is because there is radiation with um, CT imaging. Um, and it, the radiation is 100 times of that of an x-ray, for example. And so what we do um, see are incidental fibroids. So for example, if a patient presents with pain for whatever reason, um, and then uh, the patient gets an abdominal a, a CT scan, and you see this very large mass, again here, sort of pooching onto the anterior abdomen um, and kind of moving the bowel out of the way. And this is very classic for a fibroid in the, in the age group of women who have it. Um, so that, that's what a CT scan looks like. So a lot of times we'll see this if a patient comes in, say, for right lower quadrant pain and they're doing a CT to rule out an appendectomy, 
and then they'll end up having a finding of having a fibroid. In a patient who comes then to see the gynecologist, is there any other additional imaging that you would recommend? So I think if you uh, if you get this, um, you know we'd want to further evaluate it with ultrasound. I think it's a very quick, um, non-invasive, you know, pretty inexpensive procedure. So I would definitely recommend an ultrasound to again further evaluate the fibroid because you can't really evaluate it very well on CT. You just see a mass. Okay. And so what's actually very, the good thing about CT is that um, you can see we just saw that fibroid and now you see these very, very bright white spots. And when you look, it's very much the same as the bone. And it's in fact, it's because it's calcification. So um, as we age, when we have fibroids, fibroids can calcify. Um, and it's a kind of a cute thing that uh, we see from time to time on imaging. And it just sort of signals that the fibroid is degenerating and kind of slowing down. So next we'll talk about treatment options, and um, we'll include expectant management or watchful waiting, medical treatments, surgical treatments, and radiological treatments. So if a patient has fibroids and doesn't have any symptoms or has minimal symptoms, watchful waiting is a very reasonable approach. There was a study that looked at women with fibroids, and 77% of women chose expectant management and had no significant change in their bleeding, pain, or bothersome symptoms, they were able to maintain an active lifestyle and didn't really have many changes in the quality of life. There are about 23% of those women who ended up needing to move forward to, towards a hysterectomy, but the majority of them, even over the course of a year, had no other need for additional treatments. However, if a patient does start to have symptoms and they do become symptomatic, I would recommend starting with medical management I wish I could tell you that there's a great amount of evidence for medical management. However, there are limited randomized studies. I'm going to talk about four of the treatments that we use. One of them is the levonorgestrel IUD. One is combination oral contraceptive pills. One is GRNH agonist or Lupron or Luprolide and transexamic acid. So the levonorgestrel IUD is an IUD which contains progesterone. The progesterone tends to thin the endometrial lining and causes lighter periods to no period at all. It has been shown to shrink fibroids. Those studies haven't been statistically significant, but were trending towards shrinkage of fibroids and did improve heavy menstrual bleeding. Combination oral contraceptive pills do not have any randomized studies, but clinically they tend to cause lighter periods with fibroids. Lupron is um, the only medication that is FDA approved for fibroids. It can only be used for a limited period of time because it basically puts women into a pseudo menopause. So they very commonly will have hot flashes, um, vaginal dryness, and other menopausal symptoms while they're on it. It does shrink fibroids and it can shrink them from 30 to 60%. However, that's a reversible shrinkage. So if a woman uses it, for example, for three to six months, which is the general amount of time that we would recommend it being used, once they stop, it will go back to its normal size in about three to six months. So Lupron is useful preoperatively to help shrink the fibroid if it would change the surgical approach. For example, if a woman was going to have a hysterectomy and we felt like it would shrink enough that they could have a vaginal hysterectomy or a more minimally invasive technique for their hysterectomy. Um, it also helps if someone is bleeding quite a bit and they have anemia, so it would help reduce their need for a blood transfusion, hopefully increase their blood count. Um, and it is also useful as a bridge to menopause. So if there is someone who is very close to menopause, average age is 51.3 for menopause. And so if they're 50 and they're getting close to menopause but are having symptoms associated with fibroids, sometimes we'll use Lupron and hope that when we're done using Lupron that they'll be close to menopause and not have any problems with their fibroids. There are promising medical therapies that are coming up. They just um, need more studies. Letrozole is one, and it has been shown in trials to decrease fibroid volume by 46%. However, there aren't any randomized trials of this yet. Mifepristone which has been shown to reduce uterine volume by 26 to 74%. Um, it causes amenorrhea, no periods, increased blood count, but regrowth occurs after stopping the drug, and the, the um, dosage is not available in the United States. Ulipristal acetate has also been shown to reduce heavy menstrual bleeding, reduces fibroid volume, but is also not available in the U.S. in the appropriate dosage. So when we think about treatments for fibroids, I think it's always important to think about each individual patient and talk to them about what their values are and what their 
um, expectations are for the future with the regards to childbearing in the future, um, views on uterine sparing treatments, and surgery. And so I think sometimes the best way to look at this is to look at each individual patient, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, because one size does not fit all for treatment. I, I completely agree. Just today, I actually referred back a patient. Um, I was referred a patient by a gynecologist, and then I referred it back to uh, to Jeanette because I think that you know when we see patients in our clinic um, who want minimally invasive therapies, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it really is important that the patient understands sort of the limitations of minimally invasive therapy um, with respect to re disease recurrence or symptom recurrence. Additionally, it's important for patients patients to understand, you know, sometimes we can't uh, know um, what the effect of our procedure is on fertility. And so it's a constant, you know, back and forth discussion between the interventional radiologist and the gynecologist and the patient as to which way, you know, they are sort of leaning towards. And I've seen plenty of patients who, you know, are on the road to do one thing and then they decide, no, I want to do another thing. And, and you know, we go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's great because I love to have my patients have a consultation with Maureen and talk about the other procedures and then come back and we can just kind of work through the different options and make the decision of what makes the best for that patient. So the first case is uh, Christine is a 35-year-old who had a six-month history of heavy bleeding. Her periods have been regular, but they last nine days with heavy bleeding and clots. I talk to patients all the time about to, to get an idea of how much bleeding they're having. And there are a lot of women, when they have heavy bleeding, they'll say, I wear a tampon, a super tampon, I wear a pad, I still have to change my sheets in the middle of the night, or I can't go to the work the first few, two days because I'm bleeding so much that I'm going to have accidents at work. So I think that gives a really good idea of how much bleeding a patient's having. And so this patient's bleeding is so heavy that she wears a super tampon and pad and has accidents at work on the first two days. The other history that I think it's important to talk to this patient about is with her, her desire for childbearing, and then also to talk about symptoms of anemia. So if she's bleeding that much, I worry, is she feeling lightheaded? Does she feel fatigued? Does she feel like she's going to pass out? And that would be inter good information to know, especially pre -any, before any procedure. So. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just going to. Um, so here, uh, you, as, as we talked about, the most common imaging modality is an ultrasound. So, um, uh, and this is something that can be uh, easily performed. And so on this ultrasound, um, so what we see here is a um, the uterus again. So this thing is the uterus sort of on its side. And then you see um, a mass in the uterus. There's a distinct uh, difference in the, in the shape of the mass. And then do you guys see this sort of these black lines? going down. So if you were to like think about it, um, the way that this has been described as the Venetian blinds um, uh, shadowing appearance, very classic for a fibroid. So whenever we see something like that, we're just like, aha, fibroid. And then I you know, call her and she's like, yes, I knew that patient had symptoms. So of course it was. And then you, know, you realize that the gynecologist is smarter. Um, it's okay. Um, and so then what you see is, you know, and we also want to look at the endometrial lining, and that's the lining of the cavity. Um, and the reason, is, as Jeanette was describing, is the location of the fibroid can cause different symptoms. So, you know, if she's presenting with such heavy bleeding, I would expect the fibroid to be near the endometrium or maybe in the endometrial cavity. And so what we do sometimes is we ask patients to undergo what's called a saline infused sonohistogram. Did you want to talk about that? I can... Um, uh, and what that means is um, if you don't know exactly where the fibroid is and if it's in the uterine cavity or if it's pooching into the uterine cavity on ultrasound, what you can do is you can instill a little bit of saline um, through the cervix, through this very, very small tube. Um, and here, we, that's what you see. This very black area is just actually fluid, which is black on ultrasound. And you can see it outlines nicely this fibroid that is pooching into the, um, the uterine cavity. And is there a particular time that you prefer patients to have this done in their cycle? 
So usually we want the endometrial lining to be as thin as possible so that we can see things beautifully. So as you can see here, the endometrial lining um, is virtually you know, not perceptible. And so the best time for that is immediately after your period. Um, as you uh, go, uh, go through your cycle, um, t right before you're about to get your period, this lining gets quite thick. Um, and so it can obscure how much of the fibroid is actually in the uterine cavity. So right after your period would be a good time. And so sometimes um, we also get MRI imaging, um, and we talked about this a little bit. And so, for example, this is a great uh, image of a fibroid that is about 50% or more than 50% of the fibroid is actually in the uterine cavity. Um, so why does that matter, um, how much of it? So this is really important for our surgical approach. If the fibroid is in the uterine cavity, then we can sometimes do what's called a hysteroscopic myomectomy, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So we classify completely intracavitary as a type zero fibroid. So when we looked at that, those images in the very beginning of the one that was pedunculated in the middle, that's completely intracavitary. If it's a type one, it's more than 50% in the cavity, which is like this one here. Um, and then if it's less than 50% in the cavity, it's a type 2. So type 0 and type 1, we can definitely approach hysteroscopically. Type 2s, we can sometimes approach them hysteroscopically, but sometimes we can't resect them completely because they're so deep into the myometrium or deep into the uterine wall. So hysteroscopic myomectomy is performed for submucosal fibroids only. It is indicated for abnormal uterine bleeding or also when people have desired conception or have had recurrent miscarriages, and we find that they have a submucosal fibroid. Here's an image from hysteroscopy. Basically, a hysteroscopy uses a small camera, enters into the vagina, into the cervix, and into the uterus, instills fluid in the uterus, and allows us to take a global view of the inside part of the uterus, or the endometrium. Here in the middle, you can see the submucosal fibroid. So from this image, it's hard to tell for sure if it's a type zero or a type one because we can't see the pedicle, but it does look like it's mostly in the endometrial cavity. This whole area would be considered the endometrial cavity. It's an outpatient procedure that can be performed in the office or in the operating room, and it uses a resectoscope or some in type of instrument to remove the fibroid in smaller pieces. It can be used with electro electric en electrical energy, monopolar energy, bipolar energy. It can be a vaporizing te technique or a mechanical resectoscope technique. Most patients tolerate this very well, go home the same day of the procedure, and can go back to work the following day. This is the second case, Rebecca. She's a 40-year-old woman who presents with increasing abdominal girth over the past five years. She notes urinary frequency without dysuria which is pain with her with urination. If she had dysuria as well, then you start to think about urinary tract infections as well. She also reports constipation. She has, two, she has had two normal spontaneous vaginal deliveries and a bilateral tubal ligation. That's informative because probably if she's had a tubal ligation, she doesn't desire future childbearing. On physical exam, she had a 16-week size uterus, which was non-tender, and that's what we usually expect with fibroids. Most of them are non-tender. And she strongly desires a minimally invasive approach. Dr. Cohill, go over the radiological procedures. Okay, so um, here uh, what we have is an image of her MRI. Again, this is the an anterior, sort of the front of the body, and this is the back and the spine. And what's very different from this fibroid than the ones that I've shown, this uterus compared to the ones that I've shown you, is that um, there are a number of different fibroids everywhere. So um, she's definitely, it makes sense that she's having all these um, sort of pressure and whatnot uh, symptoms. So she would be a real great candidate for a procedure called UAE or UAE uterine artery embolization. Other times it's referred to as UFE or uterine fibroid embolization. And embolization means um, to block off uh, block off art arteries that supply something. So the goal here for the procedure, um, which I'll describe to you in a second, is to block uh, off uh, or cut off the blood supply to this fibroid. And when you cut off blood supply, the fibroid doesn't get oxygen or nutrients or anything, and it will slowly necrose or die and shrink over time. And so um, all of this is performed in a very minimally invasive fashion, which I'll explain in a second. And the symptom relief comes in slowly after about three months. Um, and the success is very high, so 85 to 95% successful. Usually the patients spend the night in the hospital um, and go home the next day.
So here's an image of what we do. So we have to access the arterial system in the body. So there is an artery that rises at sort of the crease of the thigh, um, at the upper thigh, and that's the femoral artery that um, is connected to the largest artery in our body, which is the abdominal aorta. So once we get into this artery um, with a very small needle and we put a very small catheter, then we can get into the artery that supplies the uterus. So here's the uterus, and this is the uterine artery. And here is our catheter. And what we do is we inject small particles, um, so little tiny plastic beads that go, and they're too big to get into the arteries that feed the actual uterus, but they're um, perfectly sized to fit into the arteries that feed the fibroid. And so sometimes people say, well, where do these beads go? Do they go somewhere else? What happens to them? So the way I would describe these beads is the same as surgical sutures or staples that a surgeon puts inside of you. They just stay there, and then they cause blood flow to stop. And when blood flow stops, just think about it when you're bleeding and you put your finger on what's bleeding, it's stops bleeding because you're stopping the flow of blood. It clots off. So then it gets covered with clot and it just stays there. And the fibroid over the course of three months will shrink to about, you know, 50 to 60% of its volume. And as a result, the symptoms will also improve um, in about three months of time. Here is an image of what we actually see um, when we're doing this. Uh, so here we have what's called an angiogram, and this is a procedure that's done under x-ray, so it's a little bit of radiation to the patient. And so this, again, is the abdominal aorta. Here is the artery that goes to the fibroid, and this very vascular thing with lots of blood vessels going to it is uh, the uterus and a fibroid inside. And you can see that the artery that's going to the fibroid here is so much bigger than the little arteries going somewhere else. And so because of that size discrepancy, um, we feel comfortable that the plastic beads that we put in don't go and, and, and cause injury to the uterus. This has been a procedure that's been around since the 1990s in the U.S. and earlier in um, European countries. So there's a lot of um, data on its safety, efficacy, and outcomes. And are there certain fibroids that are not good candidates for UAE? So um, that's a you know very controversial question, but I think um, usually when the fibroids are in the cavity, so they are hanging by a stalk, or very much of the fibroid is inside the uterine cavity, if you do UAE um, and you cause them to die, then what can happen, particularly for fibroids that are just hanging by a stalk in the uterus, is the stalk can get detached, and then you have this mass that's in the uterus, and so. So what actually you have to do as the patient is to pass it. So you have to give birth to it. It's not like childbirth, but so because of that, you know, most people don't do UAEs on fibroids that are very big and are inside the uterine cavity. There's also concern that if there's a big fibroid that's sort of hanging by a tiny, tiny stalk off of the uterus, so it's pedunculated, it's so subserosal, and then if you were to cause necrosis and then sort of the, the stalk would twist off on itself, then that could cause a lot of pain. The whole point here is we're doing this so that the patient doesn't get hysterectomy. So if the fibroid gets detached and is now in the uterine cavity and the patient has to pass it, then that also puts the patient at risk for infection. And that would mean that you know a gynecologist would have to come in and do a hysterectomy, which is what you were trying to avoid in the first place. So we don't ever want to do a procedure that would sort of go against why we did the procedure. And so that's probably one of the most important reasons. And are there situations where a UAE may not be appropriate or if a patient's thinking about getting pregnant? Absolutely. So there's very little data to tell us how uterine artery embolization affects fertility. I think there are too many variables that we can't really determine. It's you're dealing with patients who already have fibroids. Fibroids cause, um, you know, can can hinder fertility or can get in the way of fertility. Women with fibroids are typically older, and and at that age, maybe their fertility is not as uh, as the same as a woman in her twenties, uh, for example. 
So and then you go ahead and you do a procedure on the uterus. So you don't know um, what if what you did was enough to make her um, not be able to carry a baby or get pregnant. So as because of that, um, usually when I see patients who um, w- desire fertility, so they say I have to have a baby, I really want to be a baby, I want to really be a mom, or I really want to have another child, then I just refer them back to uh, Jeanette, which actually happened today um, with this patient, um, because I know I feel that if she goes in and she systematically removes the fibroid. Um, that's probably safer than me going in and sort of um, going to administer all these beads to parts of the fibroid and potentially uh, changing the dynamics of the uterus. And what's the typical post-op course? You mentioned that they stay in the um, hospital overnight, but when do, when can they return to work? What right. type of pain medicine? So um, this has been studied extensively. Um, there's a lot of randomized data, which is prospective randomized data, which is you compare the two therapies together and see if there's an outcome. So definitely we've compared it to myomectomy and hysterectomy. And it's been shown that when you do um, UAE compared to hysterectomy, um, there is a quicker uh, sort of recovery. So you usually my patients spend the night in the hospital. They have quite a bit of cramp and pain as expected with some sort of pelvic or uterine um, therapy. And they go home the next day and usually what you feel is just bad cramping that resolves and we give them narcotics and anti-inflammatories actually do a wonder, wonderful job. They usually can go back to work after five or five days to a week. Um, they do feel, you, you know, you feel like your pelvis is sore and it responds very well to anti-inflammatories. And then gradually after a a few weeks, then you feel back to normal. Incidentally, there are other places that don't require patients to spend the night in the hospital. Um, I feel that um, you know, uh, w- women, we like to you know, we like to go home and 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 make dinner and and do laundry, I and mean, that's you know, you don't. I want to take care of you, so I try to get you to stay in the hospital and you know, kind of be comfortable and and give you medicine and give you time to relax, and then the next day you feel a lot better, and then you can probably go home. Um, so now we're going to talk about this other, it's one of the newer um, therapies that um, radiologists do, and it, this is called MR, MRI-guided focused ultrasound, or sometimes it's referred to as MR-guided um, FUS or mr um, high fu which stands for um, high-intensity focused ultrasound. Um, now, this is uh, taking advantage of the ability of high frequency, high strength um, ultrasound beams that focus onto a point which can cause heating of tissue. So, if you remember, old cartoons and whatnot and you know you're you know, stranded in the woods and you have somehow a magnifying glass and you sort of hold it to the sun and you point it at wood or anything that's flammable um, you can start a fire it's the same exact theory um, but the beauty of it is it's a hundred percent non-invasive um, we couple that to MRI because be, uh, MRI technology allows us this direct real-time feedback of how hot the tissue inside the fibroid got. So just to illustrate that here, um, the patient is lying on her belly in the MRI scanner and underneath her is a uh, ultrasound probe, just like the ultrasound probe that we use for doing uh, regular ultrasound. Except the sound waves coming out of this probe are very different than the ones that you had for the imaging, for the diagnostic imaging. They're extremely high intensity and they go and as they go, they, they don't really cause too much injury to the skin. You can have a little bit of skin heating, but when they get to the focal zone or where they're focusing on, they cause quite a bit of heating. So the heating that we get is about 74 degrees Celsius. So that's quite a bit of heating. And at at that degree of uh, temperature, you get instantaneous cell death. So we essentially take this fibroid, so here's a patient lying down, and uh, focus by focus by focus by focus, um, you burn the fibroid. It takes about three or so hours. The beauty of it is you just walk uh, walk on out of there um, and uh, have a little bit of symptoms in terms of pain and pressure, but you know, typically it's a little bit less. We just finished our randomized perspective trial, so we don't really know which one's better, but I can tell you that it's a little less um, painful. Um, we are having, uh, we are still performing two um, clinical trials with this. So if anyone's interested, you can um, definitely ask me more about it. Now, when would you prefer MRI-focused ultrasound versus UAE? 
So um, again, it's a patient uh, patient factor. So a lot of pa- some the patients who present for this don't want any sort of intervention. Even you know putting a needle in an artery and injecting beads into the arteries um, is is too invasive. So that's perfect for such a patient um, because it takes so long to focus each uh, ultrasound. Um, uh, a sound wave to all parts of the fibroid, you really can't have very large fibroids. It just wouldn't be efficient. You only have a few hours. I mean, there's only so many hours that you can lie still on an ultrasound uh, on an MRI table. You do get sedation, but I mean, after three or four hours, the patients are ready to be done. So generally, if the fibroid is smaller, um, additionally, the fibroid needs to be in the front. So for patients whose fibroids are in the very back of their uterus, they're probably not a good candidate because the sound can only travel about 12 centimeters. So those are generally the things that we talk about. And what if the patient's thinking about getting pregnant? Yeah, I think that's also very, um, very interesting. So this procedure just um, gained FDA approval in 2004, so it's been around for a long time and much longer in Europe, but there's still no randomized data comparing it to myomectomy or UAE with respect to pregnancy. I know uh, that, and what I tell my patients is, there have been a number of cases of perfectly normal pregnancies and deliveries, but we just don't know um, what, what happens. And you mentioned that these patients walk off the table and go home. What is their typical post-op course? So, you know, I I don't know what it is with the with the technology of the cell death. So here you're burning the fibroid as opposed to um, the uterine artery embolization where you're cutting off the blood supply so you're sort of starving it. But that does affect these patients because they don't have as much pain. I can't prove that to you yet, but I mean, this, I was the one doing these uh, for the trial, but usually they go home and they take a little bit of anti-inflammatories. Um, again, you feel pelvic pain and pressure, um, but they seem to do a little bit better, but I think we'll have to wait for the data. Um, They can go back. Usually, I still tell them take a week off of work, and then you're back to work after a week. Some of them go back to work, you know, by by the a few days after. Okay, and so just summarizing what we were talking about, which one would I recommend? I really do leave it to the patient. We really don't have data to demonstrate which one is better. It's very patient-based, very much talking with the gynecologist and sort of, you know, she knows the patient better at times and she'll say, you know, I don't know if she'll want it this or maybe she'd want the other one. Um, another issue is insurance coverage. So insurance companies still consider focused ultrasound as a investigational, even though it's been FDA approved. And I think the reason is, they're wise too because they don't know what the recurrence rate is 10 years down the line. So if you're 34 years old, you have fibroids, you get therapy. By the time you're 44 or maybe 50s, um, you may have recurrence. And then the insurance company would have to pay again for you to get a therapy. Um, and so they'd much rather you know, offer um, therapy for procedures that have been proven um, to others to be just as good, if not better. Um, and uh, the recurrence of symptoms as we talk about. So usually what I say is um, it's very age dependent. So if you're dealing with a younger patient and she has multiple fibroids and you do uterine artery embolization, the fibroids could come back, you know, in 15% of the time or 10, 15% of the time because they're very young until they go to menopause. If you're dealing with a patient who's closer to menopause, then I don't feel that they're going to suffer from symptom um, recurrence. Um, The same is not really known for uh, for MR guided focus ultrasound because we just don't have that much of a long-term data. You know, we'll know in the next probably five or so years how good it is. Right. And so um, another, um, so this is a really cool um, procedure as well. So it's laparoscopic radiofrequency ablation. And, and the technique of um, RFA um, or um, radiofrequency ablation has been around for years. So basically, you have a probe here that is inserted into an organ or into a tumor in an organ, and it doesn't have to be the fibroid. It commonly is the liver for liver cancer or metastasis in the liver, so any organ. And what happens is because of uh, RF energy, it heats up the tissue and again burns it. But this one is invasive. You actually have to put it in the organ and into the mass as opposed to focus ultrasound where you just use the beam um, to focus uh, the, the sound waves. So here what we do is we, um, we place the, the, and 
I have a picture of this. So here, for example, we have an MRI. Here's the fibroid. Um, and the procedure has to be laparoscopic, so it has to be in the operating room. The patient has to go to sleep. And uh, just like laparoscopic myomectomy, a small incision is made into the peritone, into the abdominal cavity. And using ultrasound, you find the, where the fibroid is, and you can see as you place your probe into the fibroid, and then you turn on the machine, and, um, and it uh, ablates or kills off the fibroid. So it's not as invasive as myomectomy where you know you're cutting and, and whatnot and it's an outpatient same day procedure, but it's more invasive than uterine artery embolization. So I think it's nice because we're giving you sort of the spectrum of medication which is completely non-invasive to hysterectomy, which is absolutely invasive. And this and focused ultrasound I would put as, as non-invasive uterine artery embolization I would put as a step more towards invasive because you're actually puncturing an artery, and then this procedure I would put as the next one because you're not removing anything, um, and you can do this with multiple fibroids um, under ultrasound guidance. And one of our colleagues is doing a study on this now. It's called um, Assessa, and um, if it's if people are interested in that, there's there's a website about it as well. It uses three laparoscopic incisions, so three half an inch or um, one is half a centimeter, one centimeter sized incisions to perform this procedure. The next case is Renee, a 32 year old female who um, presents because she felt a lump while she was lying in bed. And I do have patients sometimes come in and notice that because when you're lying down in bed, it's when your belly's most relaxed. And so that's when sometimes people can feel a mass. When you contract your belly, you're muscles are taut, and so sometimes it's harder to palpate a mass. So especially after I've seen the ultrasound or I review MRI images with a patient, I'll sometimes help them to feel it. And the easiest way to do it is when they're lying down without tilting forward because it prevents you from contracting your muscles to really feel where that mass is. Um, and she had noted more urinary frequency, so the pressure of the fibroid on her bladder. She recently got married and desires children in the next year. So this case highlights the importance of considering treatment options for women who desire future fertility. And given that she's symptomatic, a myomectomy would be a reasonable treatment. So looking at her imaging, here, um, and you guys are pros at this now. So again, this is the um, front of the body, this is the back, and this is the spine. And you can see this very large mass, right? I mean, the uterus is tiny compared to this. And you can see how she would feel this, this mass right underneath her skin. And this white um, cavity, white collection, is the bladder. And you can see sort of the mass effect on it. So it shouldn't shock you that she probably has to go to the bathroom um, quite a bit. And the other interesting thing is that the uterus doesn't have any other fibroids in it. So as Jeanette said, this would be a great case for um, a myomectomy, especially because she's considering fertility. Um, here's another um, case, a sort of a companion case. And what you see, again, this is the front of the body, the back of the body, and then you can see a little bit of the spine. You can see this bladder, the, f uh, the white fluid filled. It's just being squished at this point. And this very large mass here is a... You know, you can't you can barely see the uterus because there are so many fibroids. And this is usually when I see these patients, they want to know, well, how many do I have? And how big they are they? How, how big are they? And I say, well, how, how long do you have? You know, because to, you know, to count them, to measure them, um, quite a bit of fibroid load. So obviously these patients would feel a lot of bulk and pressure um, and, and feeling that they have to go to the bathroom a lot. So when we talk about myomectomy techniques, there are several different techniques to remove fibroids. We already talked about the first one, which is hysteroscopy, hysteroscopic myomectomy. And again, that's usually a same day discharge. So you come in for the procedure and we'll go home after. Um, the next would be a laparoscopic or robotic assisted laparoscopic myomectomy. And that's using the small incision similar to the RFA. So it's usually somewhere between three to five incisions are made that are about a half a centimeter to one centimeter. And patients will either go home the same day or sometimes they'll stay in the hospital for a night. Um, and people will often ask, when would you do it laparoscopically versus doing it open? The last would be an open procedure or a mini lap procedure, which is often a horizontal incision on the abdomen. Although if the fibroids are very big, sometimes we do need to make a vertical incision. Or if the fibroids are even above the belly button, we would need to make a vertical incision at times. Um, and for patients that have an incision that's larger, usually they're in the hospital for one to three nights. And 
I usually say to differentiate between the people who would be laparoscopic versus open, it depends on the number of fibroids, the size, and the location. So it's hard to say that if your fibroid is this particular size that we would always do it as an open procedure, or if there are this many fibroids, we would do it definitely as an open procedure, because I think it really depends on where the location of the fibroids are. Sometimes the ones that can be quite large but are pedunculated, so if they're coming off of the edge, those are still fibroids that, despite being large, could be done laparoscopically. Oh, and one other thing that I would mention about um, techniques is some patients elect to proceed with an open myomectomy or an abdominal myomectomy when they desire future childbearing because after doing the procedure, the incision that we make, especially if we're making a horizontal incision, and it, the fibroids are large enough that we would recommend a C-section for future deliveries because there is a large scar on the uterus and there's a risk associated with having a large scar on the uterus that the uterus can open or you can have uterine rupture if a patient labors. Um, sometimes patients just want to have the same incision, and so they'll elect to have an open myomectomy um, because it would be essentially the same incision that we would use for a C-section. So these are just images from a laparoscopic myomectomy. So this first one shows the fibroid is here. This is the serosa, so the outside part of the uterus. And here you've, we've already made an incision here. So an incision's made on the serosa, and it's opened up to identify where the fibroid is. And you see how the fibroid looks just like the very first image that we looked at, kind of a round ball. Here is where the fibroid is removed from the uterus, which is down here. Um, here are the fallopian tubes, just as an aside, here is the round ligaments, and then below this are where the ovaries are located. And then here is um, an image of the myometrium being closed. Um, this is just the needle, and then this is the suture material, and then this is the uterus closed at the end. So, um, And it's usually closed in layers, depending on how deep the fibroid is. It can be several layers. It can be one layer, it would depend on just each different type of fibroid. And if there are a lot of fibroids, sometimes there are multiple incisions to remove all of the fibroids. This is an example of after an abdominal myomectomy, and you can see there's one very large fibroid and several small ones. And so sometimes because um, w with laparoscopic myomectomies, it's harder to identify the little tiny fibroids, and so sometimes if it, someone has multiple small fibroids, uh, an abdominal myomectomy is a better approach. The last case is Tanya, who's a 45-year-old woman with a known history of fibroids for several years. She, over the last five months, she's had increasing pain with her periods and heavy menstrual bleeding. She feels pressure in her lower abdomen and dull pain. She does not desire future childbearing and doesn't want to worry about this in the future. So this is somebody who desires definitive treatment. She's tried other approaches in the past. And I think that it's always important to remember that hysterectomy is still a reasonable option for someone who desires definitive therapy. And um, you can see here's a picture. This is the cervix here, but multiple fibroids and often causing bulk symptoms. And here's another hysterectomy specimen. Cervix is down here. Here you can see the endometrium. Here are some pedunculated submucosal fibroids or type 0 fibroids. Here are subserosal fibroids. And here's an intramural fibroid. So in conclusion, we reviewed um, uterine fibroids, types and classifications, including the FIGO classification, that we talked about, the common presentation for fibroids. We discussed medical treatments, surgical treatments, radiological treatments, and um, hysterectomy is still an option for patients who desire definitive therapy. And towards the end of Dr. Bonnie's papers, he made this statement regarding myomectomies. I do most earnestly commend this beneficial operation, the myomectomy in the hopes that in the near future, removal of a relatively young woman's womb on account of fibroids will, excepting in exceptional circumstances, cease to be perpetrated. And fortunately, we've come a long way since 1937, and we have many different options to offer patients. This is just information about the Comprehensive Fibroid Center and the website. Um, it's a great place to find out resources about um, the Fibroid Center here. All right, well, thank you all very thank much. Thank you so much.